We gotta take this guy out. I'm going into his side. Watch out. Very happy to be joined by Dominique Gay, the senior producer on probably one of the most anticipated next gen, even though it is also going to be current gen games of the year, and that is Watch Dogs. Thank you so much for your time. Um, we, we saw a very impressive demo today. Uh, it's, there's nothing in the story. It really kind of demonstrated how dynamic the world is and how you can interact with it. Um, I think it's safe to say that's very ambitious. <laughs> I, I mean, in, in terms of just building a world in a system where you can have that many ways of interacting with it and it all kind of holds together. I mean, how did you know that you could accomplish something like that? Well, I mean, we hoped we could. <laughs> and like I said, we, we knew we had a lot of tech to build to support that. Uh, we knew we had to, to support a lot of dynamic events in our game world because we don't know what the player will do. We want him to be in the driver's seat and we don't want to force too much the objectives on him. We want him to give him the freedom in an open world to decide how he wants to play. So there was a risk, but now I'm happy to say we pulled it off. <laughs> so if, if, if you wouldn't mind sort of detailing, sort of in one given circumstance, what we saw today, you, um, you're, you're sort of breaking into a communications tower yeah. to then give access to all the internet and communication devices in the area. Yeah. How, how diverse are the options for the player yeah. in a circumstance like so that? There's three core types of players. There's people who like to be very violent. They'll go in guns blazing. Others like to sneak their way through. But we also want to support people who purely want to do things through hacking. And so those things are going to be mixed up by different players depending on their circumstances. So in this, that case, for that area, there was a lot of security forces. So if you're going to try and fight your way through, uh, the way Colin, our, our demoist, did it a little bit, uh, you can still use your hacking while you're doing that. So you saw how he was able to throw remotely detonated explosives, hack through cameras to be able to access those from a dead angle, for example. And if he tries to sneak his way around, well then he can hack through every camera, tagging all the security forces so he knows where they are in the layout. Then he's able to use his hacking also to help him along the way. I mean, we showed you how you could hack an object hacked in the gate. You opened up a gate and then the guard was like, what's going on here? He investigated the gate and he took him out from behind while that happened. Over there. So, you know, you wouldn't think hacking a gate will help you do stealth, but actually it does. So there's a lot of experimentation how you mix hacking with your other abilities, including driving, actually. Um, so, typically in, in games that, that often offer, excuse me, diverse choices, um, I've, I've seen issues where it's not being telegraphed to the player all that well what those opportunities are. You tend to just see one and you hone in on that. I cannot say that for Watch Dogs. In fact, there is so much information that's happening on screen at one time. How do you sort of strike that balance that you don't so overwhelm the player that they don't sort of pick apart how they want to take care of things? Yeah, it's a very good point. I mean, one thing that really helps us is that hacking is simply by looking, it's point and click. You look at something, you see you can hack it, you, you hit the button and it happens. So the player is going to experiment. He's going to learn what those things do. And we saw when we do play tests with the game, when a player sees a new, a new thing, a new system that he can hack into, they cannot resist. There, there's a big you know, button there in the middle of the screen. They know they can do it, and they do. And then they learn how to use it naturally through experimentation. That's the best way of doing it. Aiden also has the ability to sort of slow down time. It, yes. it looks like it's really designed to help you make a split-second decision because of the numerous opportunities that, that, that are at hand. You're absolutely what right. sort of regulates that, that power, for lack yes. of a better word? So you're absolutely right. That's the reason this power exists. So it, we call it focused. And there's a meter for it. So it lasts a certain amount of time. And you can do it while you're driving, uh, while you're in the environment with a gun, while you're just walking around. When you do, you're able to still shoot to still hack into anything and to still drive. So it's made so that you have a moment to think of your plan, look at the opportunities around you, and execute on it. So you could be, shoot this guy, hack this thing, or you could be in a car and say, okay, I'll hack this, then I'll turn over there, and you can chain those events very naturally. So it's a moment there that gives all the opportunities in the environment for the player at that specific point. And uh, there, there, there's also the notion of, of reputation. Yeah. That you, you are becoming a sort of a better and better known vigilante in this world. Um, what, what does give you good or bad or I guess gray reputation yeah. in this world and how does that benefit you as the game goes on? So it's the thing you would expect, right? For example, if you start you know, crashing into people with a car, that's going to impact your reputation in a negative way. But if you help people, if you see some people who have problems, a woman getting mugged and you help her, and you catch the criminal. So now the medias are gonna start reporting about this man who saved a woman from being mugged. 
and people are going to start texting about it, talking about it on social media, and so that's going to be good for your legend within the city. Now, the reputation is not going to corner you into being the perfectly good guy or the perfectly bad guy. It's all about the gray area. It's in the middle there. And the player is going to have that reflected back to him from people, but also from the, the medias, right? So they're reporting on him on TV. So that will change sometime how people behave with Aiden. Maybe some people eventually won't even want to call the cops when they see Aiden using his gun, because they'll think it's for the greater good. Um, and, and then how you go about handling situations. We, we saw one, it was kind of just a dynamic side mission. Uh, a, a gentleman was about to commit a crime, you chased him down. But in the course of that, quite a few cars were damaged, a lot of mayhem ensued. Does that have a mitigating quality on the, on, on, on the amount of reputation that you earn, even though you did get the bad guy in the end? Yeah, so you know, in that case, Colin saw someone who was trying to kill someone else. Now, he could have ignored it, he decided to intervene. So that's a good thing. Theoretically, he saved that victim from dying, from being killed with the baseball bat. So he chased the guys through the city, and I agree with you, he caused a lot of chaos on that one. Uh, so that's what's basically going to happen is at the end of that event, when he finally managed in this case to catch the guy in the city, well, he's almost scored on how he did it, right? He actually had to shoot him down, but the guy started shooting first, so it was an adequate way of responding to violence. So in this case, it still had a good impact on him. The story would be, well, Aiden Pierce shot down a crazy guy with a gun mm -hmm. who was trying to kill someone else, so it's a good story. But, the, but like you said, it caused chaos. So the reputation is going to be balancing this. When, when he goes to kind of hack into the CTOS yeah. hub, that obviously opens up a lot of the communication devices in the area. Um, sort of thematically, you can contrast that with what you see in both the Assassin's Creed and the Far Cry games, all made under that massive house <laughs> up there in, in Ubisoft Montreal. Um, I, I definitely saw those similarities. Yes. How much of those kind of models of the other games are incorporated into Watch Dogs. We're definitely learning from each other's good, good things and mistakes. And one of the things that we, we thought was really great in Far Cry 3 was how when we came back at the office the day after we played, we had stories to tell that were our own. We weren't saying, yeah, I played Mission 4, this is what happened. We said, I was attacking a camp I wanted to attack, and a tiger jumped on me. And that was my story, that was my moment. And we thought, this is very rich. This is already something we're doing but we definitely learned from some of the good ideas they had in that game. So I think eventually it's a good thing that we're able to share our good ideas between the project and Ubisoft. I mean, is, is, is there any concern that there might, granted we saw just how dynamic the game is, which makes it quite distinct, but that there is sort of a, a, a sameness? Are you, are, are you cognizant to sort of make sure that there is a clear, unique identity to Watch Dogs? Yeah, and I'm not really worried of that happening. I mean, we're, we're, we've been working on it for four and a half years with a very strong desire to create something new and fresh and relevant. And just the, the context is vastly different, the core teams are vastly different. But I think it's natural to get to learn from what are the best games out there. If you look at how Far Cry managed its open world, it was really good. It managed to give me the real sense of being free within an open world. So we learned a little bit from that for sure. Um, now, the, the dream, I and mean, you are describing, I think, what so many people have wanted to see in the game, which is you really have so many ways that you can interact with the environment around you, and you're seeing response coming back. Um, so much of that, though, is predicated on artificial intelligence. Yes. And obviously, sort of the generation of consoles and PCs that we have, there's some strong AI, but you start to see those patterns. I mean, how, it sounds like the, the, the crux of what's going to be accomplished on Watch Dogs may really live or die on really believable and independent thought coming from the characters. I mean, is that something you guys can accomplish? Yeah, and that's something that we were very aware of from the beginning. I mean, take just a car chase. I mean, you can script a car chase. If you die, you'd restart it. It's always the same. But if you have the ability to hack into blockers that block a street, then you can't script a car chase, because what will the AI do? It will try to avoid this, it will take another route. So even just how a car chase happens required us to build a new kind of AI that was aware of all the things that could go wrong, that could steer its way around the city, and that could you know, react to all the hacks that Aiden is able to do, or all the various tools that he has. And that's true for almost all of the core gameplays that we have in Watch Dogs. So that's why the game took, took four and a half years to build. We, <laughs> we kind of knew from the beginning we had to build from scratch new ways in, in AI and in physics and many other areas to support our gameplay. You know, it feels wrong. No, this isn't your home, but it can be. Um, so, so, so one final question. We, we were watching it. Obviously, it's about sort of a lone vigilante in an urban center. Yeah. You did mention that he has the ability to have IEDs. Yeah. It's in Chicago. Obviously, you had no idea what the world would be no, like four and a half years later. Yeah. Uh, there's obviously horrible handgun violence yeah. that's happening in Chicago. Are, are you guys kind of cognizant of that? Is it causing you a concern that you might want to sort of 
reshape things just to be sensitive to, to things that are happening? I mean, we're already we're sensitive to it in a sense, right? We, we, uh, we're, we're trying to make a game where players are free to make their own decisions, but fundamentally they play a vigilante, a guy who's out for the people, who makes decisions in order to impose some form of justice on the city. So that's his agenda, ultimately. Uh, he wants to intervene in people's life for a form of greater good. So this morality is going to be defined by the player, but it's still you know, in an area that we think is a, is a variable path for players. Well, awesome. Um, obviously, everything I saw today has made me all the more intrigued about the game. Uh, when is it coming out? Uh, it's coming out November 19th uh, in Worldwide, and, uh, and it's going to be coming out on PlayStation 4 as soon as it ships for launch. All right, well, awesome. Thank you so much for your time. Nice talking to you.